Hi, in this video we're going to look at solving this differential equation and initial condition that's given for that differential equation. So uh, first of all we want to think about what type of differential equation this is and then think about what we know related to solving that type. Alright, so uh, in looking kind of at the details here you should see that it's a second order differential equation. It is a linear differential equation, non-homogeneous differential equation. And the other thing to notice here is that I have variable coefficient function. We've done a lot with constant coefficients for the terms involving the dependent variable. Uh, but here we have one with a variable coefficient function. All right, so we're going to do two things in this video. One, we're going to look at the existence and uniqueness theorem that's relevant for this and think about what that tells us about solutions to this initial value problem. And the second thing that we're going to think about is how to solve this and I'm going to use Laplace transforms to solve this. Alright, so first of all in thinking about what the existence and uniqueness theorem tells us we want to make sure that we put it in the appropriate form for that. So the existence and uniqueness theorem for linear higher order differential equations requires that we have a 1 for the coefficient for our leading term, our highest order term. So I'm going to start by dividing through by t. So there is our differential equation and then the other thing to think about are the coefficient functions. Notice here that we are missing a term uh, that would be the zeroth order derivative of x. So I do have a coefficient function that is the zero function there. Alright, so when I look at these coefficient functions I want to think about where these functions are continuous. So these are continuous on negative infinity to zero or zero to infinity. Notice that p2 and f are continuous everywhere but the p1 function has a discontinuity at t equals zero. The other thing that's important to notice here is that our initial condition is actually given at t equals zero. And the requirement for that existence and uniqueness theorem is that those initial conditions are given at a value that is in the interior of those intervals where your coefficient functions are continuous, at least in order for you to be able to draw any conclusions about the existence or uniqueness of solutions to the differential equation. So because our initial condition is given at zero and the coefficient functions are not continuous at zero, we basically can't draw any conclusions from the existence and uniqueness theorem. So that means that we may or may not have a solution to this differential equation with this initial value and if we do have a solution it may or may not be unique. Alright, so with that in mind let's think a little bit about going ahead and solving this differential equation. So I've put here on the screen a couple of lines from the table of Laplace transforms that we usually use. So this third line we've used quite a bit anytime we do Laplace transforms in a function where we have a power function of our independent variable t. We use that so that's going to be relevant here. Uh, and then the other thing is something that we really haven't used much but is in this section that we're covering today about products of functions and so this is a Laplace transform of a product of a power function and some other function. Notice that that's what we actually have on the left hand side of our differential equation here in that first term and so we're going to be using that line in that Laplace transforms table to find the Laplace transform of that first term in the differential equation. Alright, so I'm going to go ahead and write down just applying the Laplace transform to both sides of the differential equation. I'm going to use the linearity property so that I can write that as term by term and pull out coefficients. Alright, so I've used that linearity property uh, when I apply the Laplace transform to both sides of the equation. So be sure that when you pull things out here that they are constants, that's a constant multiplication property in the linearity property you cannot pull the t outside in the same way that you pulled the 2 outside. Alright, so now I'm going to apply the Laplace transform to everything here and for that very first term I'm going to be using what is line 17 in our table of Laplace transforms. So t to the n times a generic function f of t. 
All right, so notice that we're going to be using n equals 1 here. So I'm just going to write down what I get when I do the Laplace transform uh, of that first term. So I'm going to have negative 1 to the first. And then the next part here is an order of a derivative. So that's going to be a first order derivative. Notice that if you had, for example, a t squared, you would have a second order derivative. So I'm not going to write the 1 there for that first order derivative. And then that is a derivative of f of s. So the f of s represents the Laplace transform of whatever that function is, that little f of t. So in this case, what I'm going to be taking the derivative with respect to s of is the Laplace transform of x double prime. All right, so in the brackets here, I've written the Laplace transform of x double prime. So the new part for this problem here is essentially dealing with what I've just written down. I'm going to go ahead and apply the Laplace transforms to the rest of the equation. Uh, so I do have some initial conditions. We were given initial values x of 0 equals 0. So I'm going to go ahead and plug that in. This term will be 0 and this term will be 0. It was not given an initial condition for x prime of 0. So I'm going to have to leave that as is. But the thing to remember here is that that is a constant. So I can just leave that constant as a constant. And then I'm going to do what this left part of the differential equation says. So that is telling us to take the derivative with respect to s of what I have in those brackets. So I have an s squared there. I have an x. Remember that that x is also a function of s. Right, that x is also a function of s. So when I take the derivative with respect to s of s squared times x, I'm going to need to use product rule on that. Right, the other relevant thing here is that when I take the derivative with respect to s of the constant term, that part will just be 0. All right, so going ahead and taking that derivative using product rule, I will have 2s times x and then plus s squared times the derivative of x with respect to s. I'm going to go ahead and use the d ds notation here. You can write x prime if you want, but you want to be clear that that's a capital x prime and not a lowercase x prime. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and distribute my minus sign through, and I have a couple of like terms on the left side that I can go ahead and combine. I will have a minus 2sx and a minus sx, so I'm going to go ahead and combine those as I distribute through that minus sign. Okay, so now I want to go ahead and solve this. Usually we just do algebra at this point, but here we don't really have only algebra to do. What I have at this point is actually a first order differential equation with capital X as the dependent variable. All right, so I need to think back a long time ago about what we did with first order differential equations from the beginning of the semester. Uh, so there were two main kinds that we solved a lot and then a few other kinds that we also worked on. Uh, so the kinds that we solved most often were ones that were separable and linear. And then we also did some other kinds. So let's start by thinking about whether this is a linear or separable differential equation. All right, so it is linear in capital X. If you pay attention to the capital X and what is being applied to it is only differentiation and multiplying by functions of S, so it is linear. Thinking about separable differential equation, I would have to be able to write that in the form dx ds equals a function of X times a function of s. And that algebra doesn't work. So this one is not separable, but it is linear. So we can solve this like we did linear first order differential equations. So that's been a while. So this is a good review of something that we haven't done for a while. All right, so when we solved the linear first order differential equations, first of all, we put it in standard form so that the lead coefficient is 1. So I'm going to divide through by negative s squared. And the next step then that I want to do is I want to find my integrating factor, e to the integral of that middle term with respect to s. So I'll end up with e to the 3 times natural log of absolute value of s 
when I do that algebra simplification, remember I can use that property of logarithms to bring that exponent up and then the exponential function, logarithm function undo each other. So I end up with the absolute value of s cubed. When we multiply through by that with a plus or minus, you can divide either one out. So I'm actually going to end up multiplying through by s cubed. All right, when you multiply through by that integrating factor, the key is that that makes the left-hand side product rule. And then you can integrate both sides with respect to s to undo the product rule on the left side. When you do that, I do need to be careful about this plus c on the right-hand side of the differential equation. So you might remember back to when we did first order differential equations. All right, and then also to remember that we are in the middle of some other problem here. So I just did a first order differential equation in the middle of this higher order differential equation, but eventually I need to be able to take an inverse Laplace transform. So I need to solve this for capital X. All right, so I simplified the first term there and I'm gonna multiply through by one over S cubed. Remembering that I need to take an inverse Laplace transform, I'm going to go ahead and distribute through that 1 over s cubed. All right, and here I am ready to take the inverse Laplace transform. I'm going to scroll up and point out that part of what was in our table. Uh, so it's this line 3 in our table here. So I need to force the terms in the differential equation to look like this right-hand side n factorial over s to the n plus 1, and then the inverse Laplace transform will be t to the n. All right, so here I have written those exponents on the denominator in the form of s to the n plus 1, and then I multiplied and divided each term by a constant so that I would get that same n factorial on the numerator. And now I'm ready to apply the inverse Laplace transform to both sides of the equation. And so I'll end up with little x equals 4 over 3 factorial, so 4 6, or that reduces to 2 thirds. Uh, and then the inverse Laplace transform of 3 factorial over s to the 3 plus 1 will be t cubed. And then on my next term here, c over 2 factorial, so c over 2, and the inverse Laplace transform of 2 factorial over s to the 2 plus 1 will be t squared. All right, so there I have a solution. Remember that we also had an initial condition, x of 0 equals 0, so we might be able to think about using that to determine the value of c here in this solution. Uh, notice that when you substitute in x equals 0 and t equals 0, you get 0 equals 2 thirds times 0 cubed plus c over 2 times 0 squared, and so you end up with 0 equals 0. And that's true no matter what c is. So we have actually infinitely many solutions here. And that's not super surprising because what we thought about at the very beginning with our existence and uniqueness theorem, uh, we knew that we may or may not even have a solution to this initial value problem. And if we did have a solution, it may or may not be unique. So it isn't surprising that we end up with actually infinitely many solutions here. So c can be any real number, and we pass through that point at 0, 0. Okay, so this is kind of a complicated problem, but I just want to go back and emphasize that that step of doing the Laplace transform where I had to take a derivative gave me another differential equation within the problem I was solving that was a different differential equation. So when you do problems like this, that's just kind of what you're going to expect when you use that what's line 17 on our table of Laplace transforms. That's generally what's going to happen. You're probably going to have a differential equation to solve in the middle of another differential equation. All right, there's one problem at the end of your My Math Lab homework like this, and I believe there's also a problem on your written checkup for next week that's like this. So go ahead and try those and make sure you know how to do them. There's also a few problems assigned out of the textbook that are like this.